Happy holidays, everybody. Episode 70. This is the Christmas special. Yeah. It's a very special Christmas special. (laughs) Well, we figured we would do the Christmas special kind of this week because, you know, the following Tuesday is the day after Christmas. Right. And that's kind of lame doing. So we We don't have Boxing Day here, so we can't do a Boxing Day special. It's not Christmas. (laughs) <laughs> it's not Christmas. It's not Christmas on the day that we're recording this. As a matter of fact, we just saw Star Wars. Yeah, the new Star Wars. I didn't like it. I eighty percent liked it. I didn't it. like it. No, there but there was like one subplot that I felt could have been excised. There's no reason to have the casino scene. That's what I mean. And all yeah. the if they could animals, have taken that out, it wouldn't yeah. have uh, made a difference. And then, I don't think. and then the way they handled Snoke, and then the way they handled. Skywalker? No, I just... I, well, you know it what, was though? Not, it's it like, was not I'm, in character. I'm going to say that one thing I really liked about it was that everything I thought about what was going to happen in this movie, none of that should happen. Yeah, none of it happened. And I liked that because yeah. I liked that it was like, I was like, oh, it's going that way. Oh, it's like he, like it showed that he wasn't afraid to like take it in a different direction because he knew people would be pissy about it. Yeah. And that, you know, I was like, I admire that. Yeah. But like I said, I 80% liked it other than that one subplot. I just felt like that could have been taken out because it didn't really amount to anything. It, I thought I thought it was a, a very beautiful, well filmed clusterfuck. Really, <laughs> it was kind of like they took two movies and tried to wove them, weave them together. You know, to, to me, that I, although, I didn't like, like I it. said, it's kind of like because you know, it was almost three hours long. Two and a half. It was two and a half. Okay. Two hours and thirty-two minutes. Well, they could have cut a half hour out of there, and it was still. That's what I mean. Better. They could have just taken that one subplot out, and that would right. have been totally fine. But um, you know, overall, I enjoyed it. But, you know, there were, it had some problems. But, you know, I'm going to kind of reserve judgment on it until I see the third one and I'm going to see what where they're going to go with it. Yeah, I mean, what? Yeah, anybody can be a Jedi? Just, you know, well, let's I don't just all know, be Jedis? I don't know if that's exactly what they were saying. Can I be a wino and be a Jedi? Sure. Okay. Right. <laughs> if that's what you want. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, let's do our regular shout outs. The right. Faceless Villain, my book, the audio book is up. Right. Finally. Yeah, we got to give out codes. Yeah, so I haven't got the I haven't got the free codes yet because right. it usually takes a few days. They have to email them to me, but it's actually available for purchase or available. And I think if you have like an Audible membership, you might be able to get it for free or get it for cheap or whatever. But um, so go on over there and have a listen to that. And you know, if you like it, leave me a review and all that good stuff. So I know yeah. some of you were waiting for the audiobook, and like I said, I haven't got the codes yet. But as soon as I get those, I'll be then sending you'll be them getting out. codes out. Yeah. But yeah, it is available now. Uh, we just did a movie review. It was The Frighteners. That was the yeah. last one we did. Patreon's normaling out. Yeah. Patreon has gone back to normal. Yeah. They actually, well, they had never uh, enacted the fee increases. They just said they were going to. Everybody flipped out and they said, okay, never mind. Some of the guys that left came back and actually are uh, contributing more than they did before. That's Yeah. Great. So, yeah. you know, we really appreciate like yeah. the... You, we we actually ended up only losing a couple of people and, uh, you know, some of the ones that stayed, like, upped their support. So yeah. we really do appreciate that Yeah, we appreciate that. that. We know who you are. Yeah. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and one person went to uh, Patreon also, like I said. That's, that's good, too. And that's yeah. totally fine. So, you know, if you still want to... Not su- Patreon, PayPal. PayPal, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so if you still want to support the show, you can totally do that. Like I said, if you still want to, don't want to use Patreon, that's fine. Uh, you can also go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast at wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar uh, for a PayPal account. Oh, also, if you were a $20 and up uh, patron on Patreon, I mailed out some free stuff a couple of days ago. Yeah, one of them's going to England, I think, too. Yeah, so right. be on the lookout for that. You should be receiving it if you haven't already. Autograph um, stuff. Yeah, just, you know, some free stuff I have had mm-hmm. around, and it's mm-hmm. kind of fun. So, uh, you know, look out for that. should be there very soon. Now... Because it's the Christmas show and, you know, we wanted to do a Christmas special type of thing. We'd actually talked about doing this topic before. Yeah, this is actually a request. Yeah, and it was kind of a request and I thought, well, it seems like a good time to do it. Yeah, what I for, did. Around the Christmas season, I guess. Yeah, we were doing another show and I mentioned that Revelations actually had a lot to do with, with Roman astrology. Right. And uh, somebody in the comment section says, hey man, you ought to do a show on that. Can you do a show on that? And uh, I had to go back to the guy who was a master on, on this subject. His name is Zoro. He goes on his YouTube name or his YouTube channel name is Zoroaster Zoroaster. And the first Zora, Zoroaster is spelled with, with an, an X. X. But the other one is spelled like Yeah. That. And I, I came across this guy on uh, Dr. Robert M. Price's uh, Facebook group called the Bible Geek Listeners Face Group. 
which is a private face Facebook group that you have to. Did I call it a face group? Yeah, you did. I did call it a face group. <laughs> it's a private <laughs> Facebook group that you have to ask to uh, join, and uh, then they let you in there. And there's a lot of scholarly types, some uh, in the mythology and religion, and you know they're they're from across the board. These guys are like geeks into this kind of stuff. I mean, they read scripture. For fun. You tell me. I mean, yeah. but what they'll do is... Well, it's just kind of like people that are super into like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, exactly. except with biblical mythology. Though. Yeah. And some of these guys have doctorates in this kind of stuff. Yeah. So they know what they're talking about. Well, I saw them going over the work of, of Zoroaster Zoroaster, who had a bunch of YouTube videos. And uh, they were asking each other, hey, is this check out? And they were all proofreading and checking his stuff. And uh, they were going, yeah, this guy's for real. He, he knows what he's talking about. And some of the Bible Geek members were also helping him, helping him in this research. It's interesting when you watch his video series on both Daniel and on... His, Daniel was easy. He thought Daniel was easy to decode. But uh, if you watch uh, him decoding from the very beginning revelations, he will go back and correct mistakes that he made in prior videos. So it's really fun to watch a guy go through the entire thing and then change his ideas as he goes based on new information. I think it's what, 16, 17 videos, I think. Well, the revelation one, his initial uh, breakdown, I think was 25 videos. 25, okay. And then he made like an updated one that was four where he just kind of summarized everything. And then the Daniel one is 10 videos. Right. But they're not super super long like some of their between like three and seven minutes right to watch them, to watch them all takes about an hour from what i remember an hour yeah. an hour and a half and some of it can get kind of uh intensive but he does show you pictures of what it is he's talking about and layouts of of the material uh but what, what our show is going to do tonight is we're going to uh basically kind of do an overview and we're going to highlight a couple of things from that we thought were interesting that we thought yeah. were interesting from revelations possibly daniel yeah possibly yeah daniel. i have that too Right. I mean, I thought the Revelation stuff was more interesting. The thing that I find cool about this guy, and I don't know if he's... I mean, because the Daniel and Revelation videos, he posted them in 2011. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he's... Um, I don't think he's posted anything pertaining to that. He's posted a bunch of other stuff. But um, I don't think he's posted anything about Daniel and Revelation since then. But the interesting thing about him is that... He's not a theologian. He's not, I mean, he has a degree, which I believe is in history or Russian mm -hmm. history. I think his degree is in, but it's just something that he's interested in. But he admits that he was kind of raised religious, but he's approaching this uh, from an outsider point of view. He's right. like, I wanted to kind of approach it with a, with a new eye and try to just see what direction the text would take me. Yeah, because, you know, the the evangelistic interpretation of Revelations is garbage, okay? Yeah. You can't, you can't take what they're saying. I mean, that's the way I used to see it back when I was religious, when I was a kid. But that's not what the text is talking about, and we'll get into that. And that's what I thought was interesting about this. It seems like a lot of, particularly, like you said, evangelical uh, interpretations of Daniel and Revelation kind of hinge on the fact that the stuff in there is prophecy, that it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, that's what they're saying it is. Right. But he's making the argument, and other um, Bible scholars make this argument too, that it's actually kind of allegorical, an allegorical story about stuff that already, already happened. happened. Right. Although he is saying, the guy that makes these videos, uh, the Zoroaster guy, he specifically says, I don't think that these people wrote these books to like try and fool anybody or to like say, I can see the future, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, perhaps it was because maybe they perceived time as cyclical. You're right. And so they said, well, the past will repeat itself in the future. So, you know, they're taking past events and weaving an allegorical narrative about them that they think will have right. an impact on the future as well. Yeah. So it's, it's prophetic in that way, but not in the sense where they were psychic and they knew what was going to happen and stuff like that. They're very clearly writing about stuff that had already happened. Yeah, I don't totally agree with him on that particular aspect. I think what's happened is is the person is writing down the authors and yeah, it's not one author no, definitely in not. any of these books. The authors are talking about things that already happened and that may lead to the destruction of Rome in the case of Revelations. When is Rome going to end? Basically is what they're yeah. saying. It'd be kind of like a guy sitting at his house watching the news and has been watching the news for 40 years, writing down the headlines, going, yeah, and then there was Ronald Reagan, and the fire almost fell from the sky, and it was the end of the world at any moment. And then there was George Bush, 
And then, you know, then he attacked this Saddam Hussein. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, when is it going to end? When is it going to end over and over again? Jesus is coming any day. That's basically what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. And, the, and you have to think, too, that, I mean, in the context of the times, you know, these were Jewish writers, Christian yeah. writers. The Roman Empire was not kind to them. And no. they had no love for the Roman Empire. So a lot of the kind of villains in the story yeah. and a lot of the stuff that they wrote about were about their oppression by the Romans. Right. And so one, there is a lot of that in there. And one guy's got the book and he's basically on watch. He's taking care of it and putting entries into the book. When he dies, he passes it on to another Christian who picks up the mantle. You know what I mean? And he starts writing things down. And then he goes back into the past and kind of touches up certain things here or there. Yeah. Which, you know, we'll talk about that when the time comes. They're trying to foretell the death of Rome and the arrival of Jesus by, by writing down the headlines, basically, of history. Yeah. And then looking back into history, going, it's got to it's be happening in any minute. You know, yeah. That's what I, I definitely think that that's kind of the overarch. And right. like I said, you know, I have read there are um, a couple of criticisms of some of this guy's stuff, but they seem fairly minor. I don't, like, I'm not a huge theology expert, but, I mean, most of the stuff that he says sounds pretty reasonable and it checked out with the bible geeks and and, yeah. and the, when you talk about the bible geeks there's a couple hundred guys there all of them of this different disciplines yeah they couldn't find anything wrong with it they said it, it rang true and i think if i remember correctly i think i think dr price came in and go yeah it sounds like he's got it it was something like that yeah so yeah so like i said there i'm sure there's things that he could be criticized about or something because he's not you know he's kind of an interested amateur yeah but um yeah, most but, of the stuff he said it made a lot of sense to yeah. me yeah. All the great discoveries were done by interested amateurs anyway. Hobby is the greatest form of study. Well, yeah, because this, he's not, know. I mean, he's not being paid to do that. He's no. not, he was just something he was interested in. And it was a project he wanted to do. And these scriptures do. are not science. These scriptures are scripture. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, it's literature. So do you want to talk about Revelation first? Let's talk, talk about, about, let's talk about, let's talk about Revelations. Okay. So the couple things that I wanted to talk about, the first thing we wanted to talk about was... The Whore of Babylon yeah, and that kind of whole story. Yeah, more like an allegory. Yeah, yeah. that whole allegory. Because that, that was the part... I mean, like I said, he breaks down the whole book chapter by chapter... But most of the stuff that he's interested in, most of the stuff that I'm interested in is the allegorical stuff. Like, what right. did this represent <coughs> to this particular writer? Now, even though I think, and this was one of one of the criticisms that I read of his stuff, that um, I've seen a lot of biblical scholars say, you know, the Whore of Babylon is obviously an allegory for Rome. Yeah. Now, some people have said, no, it's Jerusalem and all this other stuff, but I don't know. But on his videos, he's like, I'm positing that it's Rome. Yeah. Because the Whore of Babylon, she's riding on a beast that has seven heads, which he says represent the seven hills of Rome. Yeah. And um, all the horns represent the emperors. Right. And yeah. he's saying it also represents seven kings. Yeah. And then there's like another horn, and then there's ten horns, which he's arguing represent the Roman emperors in order. Yeah. Okay, so the verse says, you know, the seven kings. There's five of them are dead. There are they've already gone. One of them is alive now at the contemporary time it was written. One is yet to come. And then there's an eighth one who is kind of um controversial sort of figure. But we'll mm. get into that in a minute. So the first five that are dead, he argues are Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius, who were the first five. Right. Emperors. Now, the one that's alive now, the sixth king, mm -hmm. that's Nero. Or alive in the time of the writing. Alive at the time. Yeah, alive is, with contemporary. Yeah. Is Nero. Right. Now, Nero was a reviled figure mm -hmm. among the uh, Jewish and Christian early writers, mm -hmm. probably because he persecuted them mercilessly. And, uh, things or that's that, how the story goes. Or that's how the story goes. Yeah, some have questioned that. Yeah. So, um, so he's saying in Revelation, the verse 16 referring to fire and ruin and things like that. He's like, that's probably referring to the great fire, uh, which happened in 64 CE, which some, which rumors kind of came after that mm. Nero had started that. Right. Even if he didn't start it like himself, like he had right. it started. So because after that part of the, after it all burned down, he built some shit on top of yeah, it. Yeah. Big palaces and stuff. Right. It was so, kind of like a real estate grab. Right. And also the fact that after the fire was over and the destruction had happened and everything like that, that Nero was very quick to blame the Christians for causing the fire and therefore justifying his further persecution of them. So he, so those are the first six kings. Now he says the seventh king is probably, he's like, this word where it gets a little problematic because 
After Nero committed suicide in 68 CE, there was a there were three different guys like vying to be power. emperor. Yeah. yeah. And this was uh, Vitellius, Otho, and Galba. He's like, so I'm not sure if like the seventh king refers to one of them or whatever. Now, this is in one of his videos, like actually the first one, what he did was he made the original series that was 25 videos long talking about Revelation. He made that and you could see that he was kind of sorting stuff out. He said, I'm just kind of going chapter by chapter. I'm not reading ahead or anything right. like that. So I'm just kind of doing these as, as they go. And then later on, he made like a summary set of videos that were only four videos where he kind of clarified some of the stuff that was kind of muddled in the first one. Because in the first one, he was like, oh, well, maybe the seventh king is just those three emperors. Mm -hmm. And then the eighth king was supposed to be... Um, Titus, right? No, Vespasian. Vespasian. Okay. Who was the next one. Because Vespasian was the one that took over after the three... They, they weren't really vying for power. It's like one of them was emperor, then another one was emperor. And so it was just like happened over this one year. Right. But then like the more he read about it and stuff like that, he's like, okay, well, here's what I've come to the conclusion. He's like, because the eighth king is such a weird, they call the eighth king one who was, but now is not. Right. And they have all this stuff about, because he's talking about the relationship between Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. And there's the stuff about the two beasts and everything right. like that. And he's arguing that the eighth king is actually not a real person, but that he's an allegory for Nero returned through okay. someone else. Right. Like a, a, an emperor or a king that is possessed by the evil spirit of Nero. Right. Because right. he makes the point, he's like, one, Jews and Christians were terrified of Nero. Right. You know, he had fucked him up real good. They did not like him. And he's like, a lot of them at the time did not believe that he had really died. Right. And he's like, for many years afterward, like Nero pretenders would like show up here and there. So he was almost like this boogie man. Right. So he's arguing that he's like, whether this was referring to an actual king or not, he's like, I'm kind of arguing that the eighth king was not a real person per se, but was actually kind of like the resurrected Nero or someone okay. channeling Nero. Okay. And what he ends up arguing is that there's this whole thing about, like I said, he's making the relationship between Revelation 13 and 17 about the two beasts, the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. Now, the beast of the earth, he makes a pretty good case that the beast of the earth refers to Titus. Yeah. Now, Titus, I believe, was Vespasian's son. Yeah. Exactly. Now, he was not an not emperor, an emperor no. at the time. He no. became one later. He was a general. But yeah, yeah he was a general. Now, right. Titus was the one responsible for the siege of Jerusalem. Right, when they lost the Which was a temple. big deal when they lost the temple. Yeah, right. in 42 months. Right. All the biblical references to 42 months, he's arguing, are probably a reference to that because that's about how long it took. So he's arguing that Titus was the one like having Nero speak through him. Right. And there's also there's also a reference to to the quote unquote mark of the beast, mm -hmm. which he argues is a coin. Right. He's like, because Jerusalem, Judea, they had their own money. Right. right? And they did not want to come under the Roman um, system. Come under, come under the Roman system, which right. included the money, which had a picture of Nero on it. Right. So if you got involved with the with the Roman money system, you were basically taking the number of the beast. Yeah. That's what they're saying. That's what he's arguing. Okay. He's like, there could be. He's like, there is some scholarship mm. that says that the mark of the beast could also refer to like the Roman eagle standard, um, mm -hmm. like how some people had to like bow to it or how they would like touch it to their forehead or something like that. He's like, I tend to think it's just an economic reference that it's right. just a coin that it represented. Yeah, well, because if you coming under Roman rule, which didn't they didn't have, want to, and do. if you didn't have the mark, you couldn't buy or tr you couldn't buy right, trade right, or right. sell. So they didn't want to be absorbed into the Roman economic system is, is what they're saying. Right. And yeah. And that, and he thinks that that's what they're referring to. Right. So in this way, he's kind of thinking that Titus is the beast of the earth. Okay. And that the beast of the sea is actually mm -hmm. Nero. Right. So the beast of the earth is like, or the beast of the sea is like speaking through the beast of the earth. Right. Because he said the Bible specifically says, I, I think it's revelation uh, 17 that says, that the beast of the earth doesn't have any authority of his own, right. but has like borrowed authority. It was given to him. Right. right. So like I said, Titus was not an emperor at the time. He became one later, but at the time he right. wasn't. Now he's also arguing that the the other horns that they're talking about were um, future emperors. You know, this would include, include Titus, Domitian, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius, Lucius Verus, Marcus Aurelius, 
and Commodus. And he's like, maybe Septimius Severus. Mm -hmm. He's like, but maybe not because that guy, he's like, I kind of want the 10th one to be Commodus because he was kind of the emperor that he was the last one before the empire started to decline. Right. And after him, you know, it was another situation like after Nero had died right. where there were several people like vying for the throne. Right. So he's like, so if the eighth king is allegorical, then the 10th king becomes Commodus and that makes a lot more sense. So you know, we have like a weird situation where you have an author who's telling you that one of the kings exists now. Yes. But he knows the kings that are coming. Right. But that's kind of weird because he's using allegory to paint a picture of history. But he's telling you a history as if he's in the past. As if he's in the past. Which is kind of strange. And I guess that's some of the, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to really want to say trickery, but part of the art of uh, giving you a prophecy. Writing about the past that you already know and putting yourself in the past when you write it to make it look like that prophecy got fulfilled. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Well, happening. it's the same thing. And like I said, a lot of uh, prophetic kind of uh, writers have done this where you kind of mask things in layers of allegory and stuff. So one, so it's vague enough that it could kind of refer to anything. Right. You know, Nostradamus uh, also did that. But, you know, making it, taking stuff in the past and dressing it up in like right. fancy language, which mm -hmm. seems to be what these people Like did. you're telling it from the past and like that this prophecy is older than it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. That's And that's exactly what seems to be going on there. Now, he also makes an argument that he's talking about the, you know, the very famous uh, number of the beast, yada, yada. Now he's saying that even back in the day, like very, very early biblical criticism, but concerning the number of the beast, you know, which obviously everybody nowadays thinks of it as 666, but he's like, even back in the earliest days of biblical criticism, there were two schools of thought on that. Either it yeah. was 666 or it was 616. Yeah, the ancients say that there's more than one number. Yeah. They refer to, could be this number or that number. They don't know. And he makes the argument too. He's like, and you have to think too that we're using, I mean, 666 and 616, that's Arabic numerals. He's like, yeah. they would have used Greek numerals, which yeah. would have been X, I, C. Right. He's like, which in a way is kind of the same. Like it's sort of like X and C are like the same number, but just in a different slot. But he's like, so really any kind of, you know, numerical <clears throat> number of the beast or anything like that. And he also makes the argument, he's like, I kind of lean toward the fact, and I think he might be right on this, yeah. that he's like, I don't think whoever originally wrote Revelation actually put the number in there. No, it does. When he's he like, I think that it just said, you know, let him who has wisdom calculate the number of the beast. It is the number of a man. That's it. Period. And then like, somebody came back in later and said, and, put and it, his and, number is, is right. 660. Right, because he's making the point. He's right. like, look, if this is a numerological reference to someone, right. most people think it's Nero, but it's been fucking thrown around. Like right. everybody's 666, number of the beast, Antichrist, whatever. He's like, if you, but if you already knew who that referred to, yeah. why would you need the number? And would, vice right. versa, you wouldn't need it. So he's like, so I'm kind of leaning toward the fact that the original writer did not put it in there. Yeah, and he would have he would have written that in passage entirely different had yeah. he had the number. Yeah, he said, you know, that whom hath understanding understand that the number of the beast is six hundred and sixty six. Yeah. You know what I mean? It would have been direct. I think he's right. I think that passage there, his number is 666, was I think added. that might be a later interpretation. Somebody calculated it. Somebody who thought they had right. wisdom went and calculated it and then put, and it, then in put it in, it in there. there. And like right. I said, there was controversy over whether it what was 666 the, or, or 616, 616, even at the time. Because it's written in both. There's an earlier version of that book and it's yeah. 616. Like, yeah, he even went back to right. like a like a theologian from, I don't even remember what century, it was Arrhenius. Right? Was it Arrhenius? It might have been Arrhenius. Yeah. Yeah, where he said even then there was controversy about w what controversy about which number it was. So he's like, so I'm kind of thinking that it wasn't in there yeah. originally. So there right. was like kind of a fight about what it's kind of like they should put in know, there. It's kind of like saying, open the lock and you'll know what the combination is. Yeah, that's it, yeah, that's essentially right. what he was saying is right. that he's not arguing. Or you had to have the combination to open the lock. Right. right. He's not arguing that there's not like numerological references in there. Right. He's like there probably are because right. that was kind of a big thing and they did that a right. lot. But he's like, the thing is, it, at the time it was written, they would have known who he was, who they were talking about. Right. So he's like, so you wouldn't need the number because you go, oh, that's Nero or whoever right, yeah. it was. But yeah, so he's arguing that that wasn't in there. 
All right, so we're just about at the halfway point. So I'm gonna take a break right now. And then when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about Revelation. And we might go a little bit into Daniel and maybe some more kind of Christmassy shit. Yeah, show might run a little long. It's all right though. Yeah, but that's all right. It's a Christmas special. It yeah. can run long. And you know, just for being a Christmas special, I am, you can't see it, but I'm drinking pumpkin spice. What is this? Pumpkin spice it's, something it's, or other. Uh, it's, that's it's pumpkin like a pumpkin pie. spice. No, it's pumpkin pie liqueur. It's very good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I got uh, eggnog with rum. Yeah, see? Yeah. I don't have rum in mind, do I? For the holiday season. No, that's yeah. that's got something in there. It's just some kind of liqueur. Oh, it's yummy. That's girl stuff. <laughs> it's good, though. Well, it's good. I'm a it's girl. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right, so I can drink mm-hmm. it. All right, so we will be back in just a few minutes. We're back talking about Book of Revelation. Now, this yeah. is my favorite part. This was my favorite part of all his videos. And all his videos are really good and super interesting and stuff. But I love this shit. Yeah, and I think this is probably yeah, spot on. Actually, actually, the horror of Babylon stuff is kind of boring because most people know that that's Rome that they're talking about. Yeah. This is when it starts to get good, really. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not like a, you know, a super biblical theologian or, mm-hmm. you know, expert or anything like that. But I don't think I've ever really heard anyone kind of come to this particular conclusion before. Now, Zoro- Zoroaster was doing his homework here, man. Yeah. But yeah. this actually seems pretty right. like when I when I heard it, I was like, yeah, that sounds that's what they're talking, that's what they're yeah. talking about. Right. So we're talking about Revelation 6, the very famous, you know, the opening of the seals. The opening of the seals and the horsemen of the apocalypse. And the horse four horsemen of the apocalypse yeah. and all that. Now, the way he kind of, I don't know if I want to lay it out the same as he did, but because it was kind of complicated the way he laid it out. But he's like, there are several allegories taking place. 
So yeah, like layers of allegory. Layers of allegory. These guys yeah. were high tech with all this with all this shit. Well, yeah, yeah. They, they knew like how to I play. said, they they, they knew how to games. like obfuscate. Yeah, and that's the truth. And, and they make were, it sound rather than it yeah, was. Yeah, and they considered what they were doing kind of like a science. Yes. Because astrology was a science. That was really yeah, high yeah, tech yeah. to them. Oh, yeah. So they're being very scientific and high tech when they talk this way. Yeah, so I don't think there's anything I don't like I don't feel like this is a stretch or anything like that because, right. you know, they these were well known literary devices also at the time. Yeah. But so okay, so the first thing we want to talk about, the very famous verse, and I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He argues that every time they refer to a person, like in this case the conqueror, that is referring to a particular emperor's reign. He's like, so this is a time allegory. It's telling you the time that this happened. And he's like, and every time he makes a reference to an object... In this case, a bow. Yeah. That is a seasonal allegory because it refers to a constellation. Yeah. Right. And the white horse, in this case, all the horses of the apocalypse are also astrological. Right. Or astronomical, I guess you could say, because it's not necessarily. Because it, it did have to do with stuff they actually saw. All right. So he argues that in this case, the opening of the first seal. He went forth conquering and to conquer. He says this refers to the era of Julius Caesar, the right. first of the dead emperors. Yeah. The bow refers to the constellation of Sagittarius. Now, the white horse, I'm going to I'm going to save the horses until last, I okay. think, because that's kind of cold. Another thing is is that Julius Caesar was offered a crown. Yeah. He was offered a crown, he turned yeah, it down conqueror, three times. Yeah, he was given a crown, yeah. Right, yeah. But he turned it down, he wanted yeah, to become Yeah, so a, they're like right. the, so it's more than just conqueror because there was a lot of this. Yeah, but they're yeah, talking about conqueror, Julius Caesar. Given a crown. So they are definitely talking about the era of Julius Caesar. And the next one has the red horse, and it said and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Now, he argues that this is talking about the era of Augustus, a.k.a. Octavian. That's Caesar's stepson. Right. Who yeah. reigned during a time of conflict, but also one of peace. And not stepson, meaning, but yeah. Yeah, meaning that he could son. bring peace, but he could also take it away whenever right. he wanted to. Uh, the sword reference doesn't particularly um, allude to Augustus. It is probably an allusion to the constellation Perseus. So the next one is a black horse. He that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. You should probably know what that refers to. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The economic references here are probably a reference to the next emperor who was Tiberius, who consolidated power and whose leadership brought uh, a great deal of wealth to the empire. And the reference to the scales, of course, is the constellation Libra. The next is the pale horse. His name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him or Hades, some of them say. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. This is a likely reference to the next emperor who was Caligula. He bankrupted the state. He killed the wealthy. He stole their money. And he presided over a famine and a plague that took place around 39 CE. Now the reference to hell or Hades, probably a reference to the Hyades cluster of stars, in the constellation Taurus. Now the fifth seal, this is kind of like, this one does not have a horseman that goes along with it. This is almost kind of like one that's like, why isn't the end of the world coming yet? You know what I mean? What I saw that. under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Like, when is God coming to kick ass on yeah. all our oppressors? Yeah, this guy and when that guy that and happen? this guy and this guy comes and that guy. They're all bad. Why is this shit still going on? Right. That's, that's, that's essentially yeah. what he's saying. Right. Now, he's saying that this reference, since there's no horsemen and stuff like that, this is probably a reference to the reign of Claudius who actually was a very good emperor. There was yeah. a lot of stability um, and all this other stuff. Now he's arguing he's like the altar reference it was a little weird. It might just mean a regular altar, but he does note that there is a constellation called Ara, the altar. That's right. what it's called. Now he's like, this is a very rare constellation. It's not usually seen that far north. All right. So he's like, so I didn't know if I wanted to go in this direction when I saw that. But it all worked out in the end. There's no horse because Claudius was, uh, he was limp. 
Or not limp, what do you call he it? He had a cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, He yeah. could not ride a horse. Couldn't yet. ride a horse. That too. Um, he, he's like, yeah, that might have something to do with right. it too, why there's not a horseman. And then the famous uh, sixth seal, opening of the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood and all this other stuff. Now, he's arguing that the sun turning black, he's like, that can only mean one thing, an eclipse. So what he did was he's like, so I went on NASA's website and I wanted to see if there was an eclipse. He's like, the, because the way this is written, because yeah, the sun turns black and the moon is, he's like, that's an eclipse probably. But he's like, the stars of heaven fell onto earth, even as a fig tree cast, casteth her untimely figs. And the heaven departed as a scroll and is rolled together. Every mountain and island moved out of their places. It's like everyone, there was all this shit happening. So he's like, that's probably a reference to the great fire, which again is a reference to Nero. So he's basically saying that... He's looking for an eclipse that happened during the reign of Nero, because that is what he thinks this is referring to. So it turns out that checking the NASA website brings up an eclipse that took place on April 30th, 59 CE. He's like, the total eclipse would have been a little further south. He's like, but a partial eclipse would have been visible all through Rome and Jerusalem and everywhere. And he notes that Pliny the Elder also uh, wrote about this particular eclipse. So it's kind of, you know, well documented. This, so this is what he's saying. He says, so I, you can go to this site and I guess it's still, I guess it's still around. I think it's called Your Sky. And you can basically put in any location at any time in history and see what the night sky looked like from that area. So he did that for this particular date. He discovered that all the constellations that had turned up in the uh, in these you know the the scales the altar yeah. uh, Perseus all of these they all appeared on in, that night in the night sky in the night sky in that particular order in that order yes so it's a code and he was also saying that the four horsemen he's like this is really interesting at the time of the maximum eclipse as seen from Jerusalem four planets would have been visible in a line in the same order that they're laid out in the text right Mars is the fiery red horse. Jupiter is the white horse riding out. Venus is the pale horse. Mercury is the black horse. And it's interesting too that where the eclipse happened, like where you could see it in the sky, was right near the Hyades cluster, hmm. which they're calling Hades. Right. What are you saying? You know, hell followed right behind. It right. followed this apocalyptic yeah. eclipse. And he's also saying too that he's like, even though pretty much every Bible translation um, has, you know, when the sixth seal is opening, it was a great earthquake. He points out that the Greek word seismos, he's like, earthquake is its third definition. The hmm. first definition is just any kind of upheaval. Right. So he's like, so he's arguing that the apocalyptic event was an eclipse. Right. Not an earthquake. Right. And he's saying that this is an astrological allegory about stuff that happened the night of the eclipse, like the way the constellations moved, right. the way the planets were, and things of that nature, which I thought was pretty cool. And that actually sounds pretty legit. Yeah. Now, some people might wonder, how the hell could the guy, if a guy writing this, how would he have access to all that information? If he's writing about it in the past, he had to have been there to see all this happen. And I'm going to say, no, he doesn't have to. Because you have to remember that the Romans back in those days had computers that were mechanical, like the Antikythera device, that could tell you what was in the nighttime sky on any given date in the past or the future. And that was a really high-tech computer device that they used. Because really, the money in Rome was about fortune-telling. Oh, yeah. So probably what happened was is that he knew through writings that sometimes in the past, what was that, 58, 59 CE? Yeah. Would, yep. In 59 CE, he knew that was a bad time and he knew that an eclipse happened. Yeah. So something must have been very important. So he went to his mechanical computer and went back to that date on which the eclipse happened. And then he looked to see what, what astrological signs were in the or, sky. alternately, oh, yeah. someone might have written about it at the time. At the time, using and, those com com and computers. And he had... Someone right. who had seen it, so had seen like it, I said, like Pliny the Elder, for example, right. had seen it and maybe made mention. Yeah, that's, um, that's another That's another. That's thing. another and he and, might have just been using that as a source. And 30 or 40 years later, a guy, a Roman guy could have checked that guy's work and yeah, actually exactly. on those computers and went yeah. back and verified, yes, that did happen in the heavens. Because this is all happening in heaven. Their yeah. concept of sky is not the same as ours. 
What's yeah. in the sky is what's happening in heaven. Yeah. So that's why all these astrological signs are so important. And, but, and they really, they're the foundations of Christianity, which we can Well, get and like, yeah, the whole Greek mythology thing. Yeah. I mean, everyone would have been familiar with it. And there was yeah. still very much of that going on. And it yeah. bled into the early Jewish and Christian writings. I mean, yeah. it's all over the place. Yeah. So, and that kind of leads me on to my next thing, too, which is Revelation 12. Now, this is a very interesting chapter. And Zoroaster makes the claim. This is the one about the dragon and the birth? Yes. Oh, this is a good one. That he thinks that this is actually the earliest or actually a proto-Jesus story. Yeah, the, story. the foundation of the Christian Jesus concept may come from this. Yeah, that's what, and it sounds pretty reasonable, like I yeah. said. So this one, um, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Now he says that the 12 stars, it's possible that it could be a reference to the constellation Cepheus, but he's like, it might be a later interpolation, which just represents the 12 tribes of Israel. But he's like, for sure, uh, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet is probably the constellation Andromeda. So, you know, so this is a pregnant woman. She's, uh, you know, having childbirth pains, something like that. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Again, seven and ten. Same numerological reference as before. And he's arguing that the red dragon is probably the constellation Hydra. And he said and it's red because he's saying that this whole chapter is a reference to another eclipse that happened in 71 CE. Same deal. You could see it. Uh, from Jerusalem and from Rome and uh, from Athens. And he's like, there's a similar kind of thing going on here where all of these stories are kind of going on up in the heavens during this eclipse because it was like such an apocalyptic event. So he's arguing that the Hydra constellation is coming across the sky. It's red because its head was kind of around where Mars was. And then there's, it kind of goes on, you know, brought forth a man child, stuff like that, which like I said, later on would kind of turn into the Jesus story, but he's arguing that at this point, it's basically an astrological story taking place in the heavens. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and the great dragon was cast out. The dragon gets cast to the earth. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman and things of that nature. So so he's saying, okay, so there was an eclipse in March of 71 CE. Now, during this eclipse, the constellation of Andromeda was situated in such a way that her feet were pointing toward the moon. Like in the story. Yeah, like in the story. Um, and this was as seen from uh, Greece. Now, the reference to Michael killing the dragon, he's like, there are some other references to Michael or the Archangel Michael and stuff like that. And it almost seems like it's analogous to Perseus or Hercules, like a, like it's a similar kind of story. So he's arguing that the constellation Hydra is going across the sky. And then sometime during the night, the constellation Hercules comes across the sky and metaphorically slays the Hydra, just like he did in the story. Yeah. And he also says, and this is interesting too, he's like, you know, the whole reference to the woman being given eagle wings and stuff like that, he's like another constellation that appeared this night coming up after Andromeda was Aquila, which is the eagle. Mm -hmm. It's an eagle constellation. He said they also made reference to a river and he's like another constellation that appeared that night was Eridanus or Eridanus, which is the river. And he's like, in the and the way it appeared in the sky made it look as though it was falling onto the earth type of yeah. thing. So they're seeing the constellations rise and fall, and they're making a story to describe the, to motions, describe the motion. motions in the heavens. Right. right. As if they're witnessing a heavenly event, a heavenly story unfolding. Yeah. And he's saying there's also a reference in Revelation 19 to um, a heavenly warrior on a white horse. He's like, so that could also be a reference to Hercules which kind of followed Jupiter, which is the white horse, across the sky on that night. Now, he's arguing that because whoever wrote this initially, you know, had this story and stuff like that, but he's like, now, later Christian writers probably layered the story of Jesus over it. Yeah. Right? So he's making... Thinking so, that they're talking about Jesus. Thinking that they're talking about Jesus. 
And what he says about that, you know, he's like, so this whole pursuit of Andromeda across the sky by the Hydra and all this, and then Hercules killing the dragon, he's like, they pretty much like retconned that. Yeah. Uh, you know, the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel from which Christianity was born. The pregnant woman, uh, or Andromeda, became Mary. Uh, the red dragon became Herod, pursuing Mary and Jesus. Pregnant woman fleeing to the wilderness, which was part of the story too. That became the escape to Egypt. The dragon waging war against the woman's offspring became Herod's slaughter of the innocents. He's making the argument that I think um, Dr. Price goes a lot into this too, because yeah. I've always found this really interesting, that a lot of the Christian stories are based in these mythological and m- mainly astrological tales that they've kind of taken them. They they took something that happened in the heavens yeah. and they brought it down to earth and personified. Yeah, it's called euhemerization. Yes, it's where you take a mythological cre- a person or creature and then try to describe it in historical ways to make it seem like, or to explain why you believe in this myth. Well, we believe in this myth because it was based on a guy who actually existed. Right. You know, the, the Greeks thought that Zeus act was, was based on a king that once existed. Right. And that, you know, Mars, you know, the god of war or whatever was based upon some ancient soldier that once lived. No, it was just made up. Well, some a person might say, well, this is in the New Testament, though, and it written after, supposedly after the time that Jesus was born. So they must be talking about Jesus. Well, there's a big problem with that. There's something called, the uh, and Zoroaster, Zoroaster talks a bit about it. It's called the primacy of Marcion. Christianity, the first Christian Bible was the book of Marcion. We don't have it because the Catholic Church destroyed it. But some of the church followers described what was in it. And what was in it was a lot of the Pauline material, which does not describe an earthly Jesus. And uh, I think one of the Gospels. The Pauline Jesus was not a Jesus really that lived on earth. He was more of a celestial Jesus. He did not come from the Old Testament God. He came from the Pleroma, the place where all the gods come from in heaven. So it could be that this is Christian material, but it's from the Pauline era, from a time when Christians did not believe in a Jesus that was born of woman. Yeah. That's why they keep saying over and over again, they do he was they do. born. He was born of a... We're all fucking born. Yeah. Well, it's Big because whoop. some of the Christians did not believe that Jesus was born. Right. So that's why that's in there that's so why many that's times. In there. Because they're asserting it. Right. But Because previous to that, he hadn't been. Right. He was, like you said, a, some more of an right. angel type of figure. So some of these uh, birth narratives of Jesus that ended up in, you know, in gospel stories may have been based on Marcionite type concepts of things that were recorded that they saw in the heavens, like this prophecy right here. Yeah. That's that's all it is. And another thing I should note too, it's like, you know, we haven't really got into the book of Daniel or anything like that, but the reason he got the idea to interpret revelation in this way as an as a historical allegory or an astrological allegory is because it's actually much less unusual for the book of Daniel to be interpreted that way. And it has been interpreted that way by many scholars. So he just found it interesting that no one had really done Revelation the same way. Because, you know, there's stuff in the book of Daniel, too, where the whole thing about uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his dream and how Daniel is, like, interpreting his dreams. You know, and there's the statue with the golden head, the silver body, the bronze waist, the iron legs, the iron and clay feet. And he points out that most biblical scholars you know, say that that statue is a metaphor. And he's like, and it even kind of says it like outright in the text, the golden head represents Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. The silver body is probably the next uh, reign, which was the reign of Nabonidus, which was like an inferior kind of thing. It's like the bronze waist is uh, thought to be the Persian empire, which took over Babylon in 539 BCE. The iron kingdom said to crush all others. That was the uh, reign of Alexander the Great. But the fact that the feet of the statue was iron mixed with clay meant that that empire would soon break into pieces, which it did. And so... And, you know, I don't think that was actually a prophecy. 
I think that was a teaching tool to teach the reader yeah, history. I think it really that's all that does was. seem like that. Imagine history like a statue standing in front of you right. with a gold head and a silver blessed breastplate. And now there's, you know, two legs break off with a bunch of little toes and it's all getting weak. We're falling apart. That's basically what they're saying. I do kind of feel like that's what it is. And yeah. like I said, if you read those biblical passages, not so much in Revelation because Revelation is kind of obscure, mm. but the book of Daniel, I mean, sometimes it says outright the statue with the golden head is your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like there he's trying to be sneaky or sly or anything like yeah. that. He's saying outright that that's what it's a metaphor. And, for. and the author is saying it's okay to look at history this way because that's the way Nebuchadnezzar looked at it. Yeah, that's, I guess that's, that is kind of what he's saying. Everything has to do with giving the author authority. What yeah. I'm telling you is true because Nebuchadnezzar believed it. Yeah. You know? So you should believe it too. This is what history is like. A picture it like a man standing there with a gold head. Well, that's this. Remember that old kingdom? Yeah, well, it's getting worse. And look, now instead of one yeah, big trunk. things are going trunk, to shit. It's going to shit. Instead of one big trunk, now you got two legs. It's breaking. They're, they're weak. And then they get weaker as they go down to the feet. And then you got ten toes there. We're falling apart. Yeah, it, it does yeah, seem like that's that. What they're talking and about. like I said, most of the book of Daniel um, that have these allegorical stories, mm. a lot of them pretty much say outright because yeah. most of the allegories in it are Nebuchadnezzar's dreams yeah. that Daniel is interpreting. Like yeah, he, he said, he, it's just kind of another way of looking at history from like a... Yeah. Zoroaster, Zoroaster, he said that, uh, that Daniel was easy. He said yeah. Revelation was a little harder, although parts of Revelation, like the early parts or like the first parts of Revelation are really good because they're very pinpoint very precise yeah but it gets more and more generalized and very confused as it goes which he thinks there's at least two authors there's one that was very precise and another one that was a little more sloppy that inherited this book as he was working on it yeah and it was edited possibly harmonized at least once by maybe that second guy or maybe a third or a fourth guy so there's no talent you're not and, seeing the originals right and he's arguing, too, that um, whoever the authors of the book of Daniel were, he's like, now, for a long time, the accepted scholarship was that the book of Daniel had written, been written about 600 BCE. But he's arguing, and actually most scholars nowadays say it was probably written more like 150 BCE. Yeah, because, not very old. Right. Yeah. So it's not as not really not as old as um, as they first thought. And you have to think, too, that the authors of Daniel, you know, they were writing about a lot of this stuff from probably a while later. Yeah. Because he says there's a lot of, like, references to, like, the Seleucid Empire and things yeah. like that. He's like, they get that mostly right. But he's like, whoever wrote Daniel kept mixing up a bunch of them Babylonian and Persian kings. Yeah. So he's like, so it must have been a while or he didn't really have access to that knowledge. He's like, because he right. keeps messing up, you know, at, at one point, like he he keeps messing up, like he, he calls Cyrus the Great, who was the one that took over Babylon, yeah. the Persian king that took over Babylon. He keeps calling him Darius the Mede. Yeah. He's like, you know, Darius, there were three Dariuses, uh, I believe. But, you know, that was... Later yeah. on, it's like it wasn't the same guy. Well, part and of the he's reason, like, and those guys were famous. So you'd like, yeah. you think you'd think he would know. Part of the reason why they're telling this story is because they didn't have standardized calendars. Right. Each little civilization had its own calendar, and it didn't make any sense. It was like the third, the third year of the rule of you know ne Nebuchadnezzar which, yeah, the which second. Which is why there's so much. And of that so you, going you on. didn't know. Okay, well, what was what was the Elusid Empire doing in in the third year of fucking blah 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 blah? You, there was no. You couldn't just say. Back in 1972, you know, there wasn't yeah. a, a universally accepted calendar. Right. So history was extremely hard to to imagine in ancient times, especially when you didn't have an internet and there was no centralized libraries to speak of in your area, maybe in yeah. another area there may have been. Yeah. So you may have had two or three different books because the book was expensive. You may have had two or three different books that were from unrelated sources and you weren't sure what happened, what happened when. Like who right. lived first? Uh, you know, were, was are the Egyptian were, are the Egyptians older than the Eleusids? Seleucids. You know, with Seleucids, yeah, you don't know. So you don't know. You know, you can't put anything in any kind of order using those old yeah. books. And like I said, I think that's why they make so many references to you know during the era of Julius yeah. Caesar and during the era of Nero or whatever, because you know there's no so, there's no precision in how no. they live in timekeeping. So the author of Daniel is just saying, well, Nebuchadnezzar just imagines it like a man. Standing yeah. there with a gold head. Yeah. And then it gets becomes silver and, those, and bronze. Yeah, and those are pretty much and like yeah. I said, they, they pretty much say in the text that they're referring to specific kingdoms. Kingdoms. So it's a history lesson. So yeah, it's basically what it is. Yeah. So, you know, so it doesn't seem it's it's not a super stretch. 
to say that the book of Revelation was written in the same way. It's written in a prophetic style, but it's written by people that lived through it, through it or lived, you know, later on. Right. And then we're using older sources because he does say that one of the books in Revelation is probably referring to the eruption of Vesuvius. Yeah. You got that one? He's like, um, yeah, he, well, there's not like a, I mean, it's pretty obvious in that chapter that that's what he's talking about. It's obviously a volcano eruption. Yeah. He's like throwing the stone into the ocean and, uh, and and destroying a third of the ship. And all that. Yeah. The water getting bitter. Yeah. That, that's the eruption. Yeah. That's Vesuvius. Vesuvius. Yeah. And he's saying that he's not saying that the guy that wrote that particular chapter was necessarily alive when Vesuvius erupted, but he's like, well, the thing is, Pliny the Younger yeah, wrote, wrote a, a book shit about ton yeah. about Vesuvius because he was yeah. there, and Evidently, Pliny the Elder was. Some of the Pliny dis- the Elder died during this. Yeah, he died in it, but his son survived. But his it, son survived, and it, he yeah. wrote a book about the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, yeah. and it was evidently a bestseller. And the description, and some of the very descriptions in, yeah. in in Revelations match the descriptions that were given in that book. So that means that the author did not see Mount Vesuvius; he just described Mount Vesuvius based on what he read, read of someone that uh, of had Pliny seen the it. younger, and he's describing it as an angel throwing a stone into the ocean and putrefying the the water, water and, stuff, and, yeah. and yeah, and yeah, destroyed a certain amount of the fleet and. It's basically, and it's funny because you can really see. There's also a lot of mentions of plagues. Lots yeah. and lots of mentions. Well, there was of probably a lot of plagues yeah. going on back then. Right. But the thing is, and you can really see the kind of thread even coming up to the modern day with like all these kind of apocalyptic, some sort of like Christian offshoots that are very apocalyptic and they're always waiting mm. for. And like I said, a lot of them interpret revelation as something that's going to happen so they're they're doing the same thing essentially that people back then were doing they're looking at disasters and being like the world's turning to shit it's all gonna end yeah there's volcanoes and you know and and eclipses and all this other kind of civilization end right so it's the same kind of thinking as now as people like oh there's wars and this and that and the other thing but it's like you know as human history has shown that shit happens all the time it's always happening somewhere yeah so you know to just pinpoint one thing and say oh there's more wars there's more sickness now than there was i can remember apocalyptic thinking from the age of ronald reagan well you yeah. think that the earth would be gone by now well yeah and like i said it now. does seem like you know i guess that sells books for them and stuff yeah. like that because we did that whole show that that yeah. fun show about doomsday predictions and stuff yeah. like that and i always kind of just you know, whatever. The Earth will be okay. It's it's yeah. fine. <laughs> you may not be in it, but you the may, Earth will yeah, be. you may not be here, but the Earth yeah. will just keep on trucking because that's what it does. So, since this is our Christmas special and we're coming up to the end of it, yeah. What do you like the most about Christmas? Fucking presents. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are good presents. Yeah, probably I don't think too much things. about it other than just hanging out, you and know, drinking eggnog and listening to music and i got a ham i got a boneless ham to cook we do yeah 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 we got a little tree up and everything you know what sucks the only thing that sucks about christmas and this has sucked since i was a child because i am from florida originally i was born here and it doesn't snow here you guys like hardly ever i like i think it snowed here a couple times but it's not even like snow snow it's just like oh look a flake and then it melts yeah i think it snowed 10 years ago yeah something like that but it's in it doesn't stick on the ground it's not like real snow So I always used to watch like Christmas specials and Christmas movies and stuff like that when I was little. Mm. And I'd look at all these people and they're all warm in the house and they had hot chocolate and they had a fire going in the fireplace. And I'm like, you guys suck. Yeah. We don't have any of that. It's like 90 degrees outside. Yeah, turn that AC up. Right. Yeah. That's what we used to do. I mean, because a few times, like every now and then we'll get lucky and it'll be cold on Christmas day. Yeah. But it hardly ever is. Yeah. Like it's, it's rare that it's like 90 degrees, but it's usually like in the seventies. Yeah. Which I guess... Some people are like, quit your whining, Jenny. Like, Uh I'm from fucking Minnesota, and it's freezing. I'm freezing my testicles off up here. (laughs) But you know what I mean? But there was always just like a romance about it that I never got to participate in. I got to do it. You, well, you Boston. got to do yeah. it, but yeah. you know, I never got to participate in it You're because I always much. lived here. You're not missing much. Really? It's the same old, same old thing. I didn't, so seriously, I did it. not see snow until I was yeah. 22 years old. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and it, I know it's no, it sucks. But yeah, I always wanted yeah. it to snow around Christmas time and I never got to see that. Okay, let's shut it down. This is a, this show was an introduction to Zoroaster, Zoroaster. The guy's a fucking genius. We're going to put links in the yeah, description. Yeah, I'll put, a, I'll put a link to his uh, yeah, channel. Uh, this is just, just an introduction to his his work, he's got a vast body of work we can't talk about at all within an hour. So go check it out for yourself. You're going to like it. 
Yeah, it was super fun, and I hope mm-hmm. you guys enjoyed this sort of uh, Christmas specially special. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, w- it was kind of special. Well, and be sure to check out our Patreon page, or if you'd rather not do that, then go to our blog, which you know what it is. Show us some love on PayPal with a one-time donation, if you would. Also, check out our latest movie review, which was The Frighteners. Check out my book, The Faceless Villain, which is now out in print, ebook, and audiobook. And uh, if you wanted a free code, it should be just a few days. I will get those sent out because, like I said, I have to wait for Audible to email them to me. And that'll do it for this episode of 13 O'Clock. Happy Holidays!